one of the things that we discovered in our research is that uh, all of these teachers of the new prophecy paradigm are going back and corrupting some of the original verses in the book of Genesis. Not only do they corrupt the Noah story, but most of them also hold to the gap theory, which is that there is a break in time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And into this gap, these men insert millions of years and all sorts of extra biblical phenomena that they claim actually happened. Now we know that many good scholarly men in years past actually believed the gap theory, just like many men believe that fallen angels could have mated with human women mm -hmm. in the Genesis account before Noah's flood. But what happens with this gap theory? What's the problem with this gap theory when we really look at it with scripture? Well, the gap theory began as an attempt to, how should I say, accommodate the Bible to evolutionary theory. You needed millions and millions and millions of years, if not billions of years, for life to evolve. And of course, uh, scientists looked at the, uh, what we call the geological stratas, and posited that those stratas meant billions and millions of years. And of course, personally, I would uh, say that the strata were developed and happened because of the flood of Noah, when the more dense material settled and the less dense material uh, was higher up in that strata. But it was an interesting theory in evolution because one dated the fact that there were millions of years by, you know, the strata, and then one dated the strata by the millions of years, so the whole argument was, was circular. So there was this attempt to really accommodate evolutionary theory so as to not make the book of Genesis look ridiculous, <laughs> as with regards to a young earth, for example, or something else. And so there were many godly men who adopted this, Dr. C.I. Schofield in the old Schofield reference edition of the Bible, uh, taught the gap theory. Uh, Dr. M.R. D. Hahn, uh, founder of the Radio Bible Class, taught it. Uh, there were many others who taught it. I think a lot of the initial teaching with regards to the gap theory was pioneered by a man by the name of J.H. Pember right. and uh, in his book. So the question becomes, how do you view this gap theory? Is it consistent with what the text of Genesis states? I myself do not think that it is consistent. I do not think it's grammatical. Now, I believe the beginning that's spoken of in Genesis 1 verse 1 is absolute. It's not a relative beginning like when God began to create the heavens and the earth. No, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The problem comes with verse 2 because there are those who want to create that gap between verse 1 and verse 2. Now, it's an interesting point of Hebrew grammar, which I don't want to get into at this point because it goes beyond, I think, what we're talking about. Suffice to say is that I believe the preposition that prefaces verse 2 is a circumstantial preposition. In other words, what Moses is describing are the circumstances surrounding the initial statement of creation ex nihilo that God created everything out of nothing. So that verse 2 says, or I should say makes three circumstantial statements coordinated with that. The earth was formless and void. Darkness ruled over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God moved over the surface of the waters. Those three things were circumstantial to the beginning statement of Genesis. Then the rest of the book of Genesis Verse 3 and following, you know, describes how God formed and fashioned and filled the universe. And so I do not see that the gap theory is necessary for any other reason than to accommodate evolutionary theory to the Bible. And I don't think that's necessary because we have an absolute God who created everything out of nothing. We're told 
in the book of John that the Lord Jesus Christ, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then, of course, uh, we're told in the book of Colossians that uh, he created all things also. And we're also told that in Hebrews chapter 1 and in a couple of other passages of Scripture. So when we get to the idea that the universe was not created, actually, it's an attack against Jesus Christ. We go mm. back to Jesus Christ. He's the creator. Christ is the creator. By him, all things hold together, Colossians tells us. It isn't the God particle that holds this universe together and <laughs> keeps it from fragmenting into, you know, billions and billions and billions of different directions. No, it's Jesus Christ. All things hold together by Christ, by the word of his power, we're told. This is the greatness of Christ, the greatness of our creator. So I find that the gap theory is perhaps, I should say not perhaps, but is untenable grammatically. It's unnecessary as with regards to accommodating the evolutionary worldview and fitting that into the Bible because that just isn't there and I just don't see it. And basic reason I don't see it is because the grammar just does not support it. The Hebrew grammar.